Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and I am sitting here today with Alicia Sylvester of Banshee Wines from Healdsburg, California. Alicia, tell us about Banshee Wines. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, Okay, so Banshee Wines is an awesome brand. It was created and founded by Baron Ziegler and two other of his friends. And And this was in 2008. They were in the dog pet district of San Francisco and what they really wanted was to make a, an affordable Sonoma County Pinot Noir because they really couldn't afford afford like really nice wine so they wanted to have like nice wine but affordable coming from Sonoma County, really based in like West County and Russian River and in our um, Sonoma Coast area. So that's how Banshee was founded. They opened their tasting room right off the Hillsburg Square in 2013 and it was very revolutionary of its time because it was, it's casual seating. And at that time still all bar top seating, all bar top tasting. And so it was, we've got the, the record player in there, we've got a couch in there and like bean bag stuff and we've definitely uh, developed and matured a little bit in the tasting room, (laughs) but that's how it really started. And that's kind of the essence of Banshee is that these are wines that are meant to have conversations with on your couch with friends. These are wines that you take to picnics with and you enjoy them with friends. You enjoy them now, you enjoy them later. They're really for drinking. And my favorite part is that Uh, you know and what I really like to say about Banshee Wines is that these are for making conversations so that we can we can have conversations with each other because we're enjoying wine and just talking to each other or we can then switch that conversation because we're like whoa what's this wine (laughs) like let's take a second here and that's really my job and what I want to bring out of the wines well to start our conversation I'm curious about the name Banshee Okay, so yeah, Banshee, it it has a lot of, it's very whimsical. And so, of course, uh, as a winemaker, we're technical. And so I'm Google Banshee. Oh no, it's this lore um, uh, of a woman wearing like a cape. Her eyes are drenched red from crying and she screeches out like, ah, I don't know, uh, the Banshee call. And um, so it's a scream of like death. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. This is not what I, uh, okay. And so I asked our marketing team, I was like, what is going on? Because I, I'm not gonna be this for Halloween. I can't be the screeching woman marketing our wine. Thanks. Yeah, I was like, ah, oh, this isn't very sexy like come on and so the, you, so what really happened was that Banshee was was made very whimsical you can see we don't have any any capsules and that really was because th- they couldn't afford it mm-hmm. and so now it's definitely switched more of like hey this is more sustainable use less so that's really fun and that's also kind of the same with the name it was that they needed the name and we are at they're at the table and some one of the gentleman's dogs is barking in the background just <laughs> going off and one of the gentlemen is just like hey get your dog to shut up he's barking like a banshee and they you know boom just all look at each other oh but then that's how it came (laughs) a dog barking who would have thought who would have thought so i'm curious do you guys own vineyards or do you um lease vineyards or a combination so that's, this is a great, great segue. So as Banshee was acquired by Foley Family Wines in 2018. And so that Banshee has always kind of been, uh, uh, had, had growers. Only grower fruit, really cute, tiny vineyards. Love that, we're keeping that. We have our small growers, but also now with our Foley background, back, you know, just like backbone of support, I've got vineyards throughout Sonoma County and throughout California. So I have have both. We use growers that are very special for our DTC program. You know, direct to consumer. We're making 150, 200 cases of these high-end single vineyard wines, and then I have my more accessible wines, which are in wholesale, and I'm making a lot larger volume. And so that I need, to, you know, you got to change your fruit, you got to change your winemaking styles for that. So speaking of which, um, I know you're making Pinot Noir, obviously, and rosé of Pinot Noir. What other grapes do you work with? 
So as BNG started, we're traditional, we're doing Pinot, and we're doing uh, Chardonnay. And then we they were like, well, we're whimsy. What else can we get? So we're gonna get a Carignan. We're gonna do Syrah. We're gonna, we kind of got all over the place. Wow. So I'm honing us back, and we're focusing. <laughs> we're focusing. That's what I want, a little focus. Uh, because that's easy. Also, we're gonna help the sales team out as well. Sure. Everyone needs to work together now. <laughs> so we focus on, on Pinot, and then we have our Chardonnay, and then I do Sauvignon Blanc, Rosé, we have our Red Mordecai, and then I do a Cabernet. And then we just released our Sparkling Brut, the Ten of Cups. So Ooh. also dipping our feet right into the sparkling game. Really fun for me. Traditional method. Yes, traditional. Ooh. Wow. And what's your total case production? Well, it is increasing. That's what I can say. Very much. A lot. Uh, <laughs> my history has been with very small brands and I've really honed in on making the wine myself and so now that I've been with Banshee I've really transitioned to having that DTC of my small little babies and then my other monster large skews which really Banshee has started as a baby and my job is to really help it grow and we're going through our teenage years and it's it's great this is a, a, con a controllable teen uh, not like me <laughs> <laughs> and so we want to make sure we're going to grow appropriately, we're not getting growing pains, and I want the wines to be consistent. This is what I want is that when when wineries really grow, uh, sometimes you, you the blends are, are can be different. And I don't I don't want to do that to our consumers. I want my blends to be exactly the same. So when you're tasting each wine, it's exactly that same one, and then you taste in six months and seven months, and everything is is really you know, the same. And that can be hard to dial in. And so your total case production currently is about? Ugh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> no, not that much. It's really not that. It's still really maintainable. For me, it's a lot. So my, caber my Cabernet program has just really grown. We released the 2019 this year and I did 25,000 cases. Okay. My projection for 2021 is making a uh, 60,000 cases. And so that's just a Cabernet. Just of the cab. So this is it's great. I mean, I have a cab background, so hey, hey, baby, let's just make great wine and make it accessible for everybody to really get them into wine drinking. Because Banshee, it can be, I'm complex, heck yes, but also fun and, and getting those conversations started. Because wine can be intimidating. I know yeah. a, a lot, everyone's intimidated, and I, and I talk to a lot of tasters, and I say, okay, just tell me one thing that you smell or one thing you taste, and maybe it's a feeling. Tell me that. And and they can really, a lot of people can, well, it feels like it might be sweet. You know, from the <laughs> nose, I'm like, okay. And we can work on that and, and, and go from there. So it's really, Ooh. that's really fun. Well, so, so you're ranging from a couple hundred cases of some wines, 25,000 cases another. We won't get into exact numbers. I'm gonna move on to what you were saying about, about what connects people. So I'm curious, what is your first memory relevant to wine? My first memory relevant to wine. Okay, so I've come, I've come from a farming family, and so we farm, we call them Ammons. Almonds from the Central Valley of California. <laughs> They're almonds. You can call them whatever you want. Please just eat them. That's fine by me. Um, I, I don't. I usually call them almonds so everyone doesn't. They don't freak out. Uh, <laughs> but so, the almonds. So, so we're at. We have my our almond ranch, and we had 20 acres of Zinfandel that was planted there when we purchased this ranch. So really, some of my first memories are are kind of my mother in wanting to be a, a, a wine drinker and a wine grower. And I I remember in the basement there was some friends boxes going on and and the white zen phase which we were helping we this is what helped start california wine industry was like getting people to drink more wine and then mm -hmm. making that wine a little better and better and better so um i think one of my biggest memories is like okay it's picking we're gonna pick and we we use uh Ale, we use la grape growers and so the the you know we're the winemakers gonna tell us when to pick but then the grower always like we need to pick before because we're shriveling you know so i always had this like grower verse first picker and like I've always really understand that that relationship and uh, so here we are we want every single grape there so me and my mom and my brother we've got a little red wagon and we're getting everything <laughs> all the second crop we're getting every drop of grapes that we can get because we because we're just little little growers I think the cheap labor 
Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it was, and it, you know, they just picked that 20 acres, just like it was nothing for for the our big, you know, our big players that are in the Central Valley. Sure. This we're nobody, but for us, it was everything. My mom's got a little grape earrings. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got some kind of grape and cow shirt going on, just my style. <laughs> I love it. So, okay, picking grapes as a child, got it. Franzia boxes in the cellar, probably not mo the most memorable wine you've ever drunk. <laughs> Now that you've been working in wine, is there one wine that stands out? Maybe it was at the beginning of your career. Maybe it was something you drank last night that just is one of those kind of iconic wines, one of those aha moments for you. What was it? I think the aha moment for me with, because, you know, you're always growing your palate and you, you're, you never really know. You're like, oh yeah, I, I taste the green bell pepper. Oh, that's not so good. That's not. <laughs> okay, great. I've identified it. But as... Um, you know, I, I hadn't been around super fine wine. I've been around super accessible wine, had college palate. Uh, you know, my mother is still was, uh, you know, learning in her wine, which I help her with every day. Um, <laughs> we all do. 50% <laughs> discount. <laughs> um, so I, I remember when I drove into the Napa Valley for my very first internship and I was there before the winemaker because I still needed to drive back to San Luis Obispo to go back to class the same day because I definitely booked my schedule tight. And I just remember like, oh, you know, driving on 29 and you're like, what is this? This is a different part of California. <laughs> I really like it. It is like, what's going on here? And so um, I tasted the wines, you know, I saw the wine winery and I'm like googly eyed and just like, whoa, this is really cool. Like very small. I've seen big tank farms. This was was really attainable. And I was like, this, this is great. And so tasting those wines, this was at Provenance and Hewitt in 2000. And 11, and I was tasting. I worked under Tom Rinaldi and Chris Cooney and Trevor Durling, and that tasting that first day, I was like, "This, this like, oh baby, I love me some cab. This is what I want to do. I want to make your mouth just like melt." <laughs> and I'm like, eh, oh yes, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, if we were to come into your home, what kind of wines would we find in there? What are you drinking on a daily basis or collecting? So collecting and what I have, I've got a lot. So okay. I've got um, my have my stash is a is a hit, hidden secret at an undisclosed location, um, a winery of course. Uh -huh. We're just hidden somewhere, <laughs> which is good. This is good. You got to keep your friends close and your wine further away <laughs> so you don't drink it all. Because <laughs> I'm trying to build my collection of uh -huh. my wines that I've made, wines that I've made all over the world and helped with. And so, but what you can find at my house is as much as possible in all dark corners of the house. You'll uh, maybe four, five, six cases hidden around the house. And a lot of, you know, part of Foley family, I want to support our family and support my other winemakers. I got a lot of Lancaster, a lot of Foley Johnson I like and always trying new stuff. I'm at Prevail, which is the red facility from for Icrono, which we acquired, and I'm, dr I'm drinking their wines. I'm drinking everybody's wines, but sometimes, to be honest, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not always reaching for the wine glass. So, um, yeah, maybe beer, maybe the sparkling, <laughs> maybe some cider, you know. It's, so, um, so you're drinking a lot more local wines from, you know, Sonoma or from the um, California regions yeah i think it's my responsibility oh. as a californian <laughs> and I, I, you know i go into other states and I'm like why don't you have more california wine what, what's going on we need to be supporting california we need to just be supporting our all wine industry in general but i i really think that it's good because people ask me like well where do we where do i go tasting where should i go what wine should i buy these are the wines that are showing me and it's like okay well i better be tasting out there and i want to taste and promote my colleagues and that that's that's really fun it's really fun so is there a wine that you opened recently that was drinking really, really good? Well, so I've been with Banshee. I've been since, it's just been my one year anniversary. So I've had to really switch my focus from like big old, big old cabs to, to Sonoma County and light delicate pinots, but still backbone. So my, I've been tasting 
all around through Sonoma County. Of course, uh, my fr luckily I've got a neighbor. She she likes Rocchioli. Heck yes, me too. Bring them on over. I've got some litter eye. Someday maybe I'll have a little little something with a crown on my label. <laughs> <laughs> the lemon. So. so basically the next wine you drink is the best wine you'll have until I, the next wine you drink. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I try. It's it's really wine. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's all about the setting. It's all about who you're with. I mean, I was just in Costa Rica. I took our unreleased rosé, and that's the best wine I've been tasting because we were snorkeling and having a little booze cruise, and I opened it with... Uh, we didn't have any glassware, but like those cafeteria kind of opaque cups. Uh -huh. um, and the the, the 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 bartender he tried it and was like, Ugh, uh, they're used to a little more sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he wasn't prepared for a, a, a proper rosé, which is fine. That's good. We shared it with some friends from New York, and they were like, I can see drinking this all summer, and I, that's what I want to hear. That's that that. Well. I'm drinking your 2021 rosé of Pinot Noir right now, and I can see <laughs> it's perfect for summer. But let me ask you something. Um, we love Pinot Noir. We're drinking, as I said, a rosé of Pinot Noir right now. You said that you started with Cabernet, and you're making all these things. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? Perfect variety. Well, isn't the, isn't it like perfectly imperfect? Really, the way to be. <laughs> So perfect, perfectly said. <laughs> and um, a little more controversial question potentially, but what's your thought on wine critics and scores? Wine critics and scores. I, I you know, it, what, they help sell wine, mm -hmm. and so I, I can see. I, I don't really know. <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying to make sure to. They sell wine. Yeah, they sell wine. <laughs> it's fun. I, it's my goal to always be making over 90 points, but really, I it's your own score. Everyone should be scoring their own palate. So I really think truly that a score is great. It helps sales. It helps really like get our wine circulating around out there. But you should be scoring the wines yourself. They should really be, you know, I really am like, okay, what's the price of this wine and how is it made? Because that's going to tell me then whether, wow, that tastes like it's way more than that mm -hmm. and way more complex. That is, that's my score is like, this is worth it. Better, like value and, and quality. So speaking of scoring for yourself as a drinker, red, white, or rosé? Red. <laughs> Still or sparkling? Sparkling. <laughs> Domestic or champagne? Or somewhere else? Oh, well, it's a trick question because <laughs> we have our bubble, so I must say California. But I mean, come on, I've been to Linz and France and all the caves. I mean, oh, hey. <laughs> So when it comes to wine, and like you said, you should trust your own palate and everyone drink what they like, but when it comes to food pairing, do you think that there are rules people should follow or is it a come what may? How do you approach pairing wine and food? Well, I think when you're pairing wine with food, you should definitely have tasted the wine before. So okay. a lot of people are like, well, we're just going to do the cab with the steak. And and if you're comfortable with doing that, do let do that. But if you're a little more adventurous, and that's kind of banshee, we, we're very hip hipper than me we're 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 i don't know hipper than hip i don't know but we do some fun pairings like french fry pairing and right now at our tasting room we're doing a grilled cheese flight which is really cool and uh i mean i'm for me and for winemakers we are my, my work is my mouth my palate and so me just tasting more and tasting all of this is is great and you say hey no that didn't work as well as i thought or yeah let's do that like we did i had a, ca a cab um for a wine dinner and they were serving salmon and i was like what what, what is, who come on who did this and i was like okay oh but it's a bacon something or rather what up oh, it was great it was fabulous and really i think that's you know, it can be our job too of like, can I pull this together with my palate or is it just not agreeing? So not necessarily rules, but just experimenting, trying, having fun and going outside sort of maybe what you would think. You just never know. Yes. <laughs> so for somebody who's never had the privilege to taste Banshee wines, not yet, of course, they will after listening to you, they'll want to run out. But if they haven't had it, what do you think they're missing out on? 
good wines. <laughs> I mean, really good wines, in, in my opinion. So, I mean, we do, for the price point, for what they, you know, it's a true Sonoma County Pinot Noir. It's a fabulous re representation of mostly Russian River and Los Carneros Sonoma region. These AVAs, it's, it's, I think they're great representation and true to variety of where you're getting fruit. A lot of my job is also like, I don't, this, the shining star is not me. It's the wine and it's the fruit. And so I want that fruit to show. I want you to taste fruit. Mm -hmm. And I want you, your mouth to be salivating. And I want you to take another sip of that glass. Mm -hmm. I want you to go back. So if aliens were to land on your property right now, and you were to welcome them with one of your wines, which of your wines would you want to offer first? First, we're going to start off with the sparkling. <laughs> and I, I have these really cool glasses that are like kind of like, like a unicorn tint. Like they are kind of cute. They're not pokey, it looks nice, and they're stemless, and so I would serve them in these kind of psychedelic glasses, <laughs> some of our, our burnt sparkling, heck yes. <laughs> so, you've been making wine for a little while now, you've got a good decade under your belt, um, and you said you've worked other places around the world? So I'm curious, we know that every vintage tells a different story, but how much do you think there's a big variation year to year, or do you find that there's more commonality? Variation, for sure. There's there's always variation. It, this We have to think about this as an agriculture product. So really, every year, we, whether you're doing larger farming or small farming, you know, the larger scale farming, we want to make sure we're getting our tons accurate. With the smaller farming, sometimes we need to get those tons up or need to get them down, but really, I lost my train of thought. I can ask that again. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, what was it? Um, um, go for it. Okay. So you've been working, your career is about 10 years long now. You've worked a number of harvests and you've worked harvests in California as well as what other places have you worked? Okay. So I've worked in five different, five different countries making wine. Mm -hmm. I started in Australia. Oh no, Italy, then Australia, then, um, and I, okay, let me start that over. <laughs> Hold on. So you've been making wine now for about a decade, but you've, aside from California, you've made wine elsewhere. Where else have you made wine? Yeah, so I did the harvest hopping after my first harvest and was able to make wine in Australia, Italy, did a little bit of cherry wine in Denmark, then I went huh. to uh, South Africa, and I also worked in Argentina. Wow, lots of different places, but you're really based in California where we're blessed with sunshine and pretty consistent weather. And so when it comes to a vintage, um, you know, some people, we know there's variation from vintage to vintage, but do you find that there's more variation from year to year or more commonality? I would say there is, I mean, our job is try, trying to kind of make it a commonality, so we're really giving our consumers a consistent product. But then when you're getting with our really small, single vineyard lots, that's where you're definitely going to have flexuality, and every year is going to be super different, but still going to have the same backbone because it's the same vineyard. So we, we really, we want to make a consistent product. I want to make the wines that you know you're going to, okay, I know kind of how that's going to taste, and of course we're going to have year-to-year -year variation. Mother Nature is in charge. We're an agriculture <laughs> product. We just went through a very cold spring. And I'm not going to say the two F words because we've got our favorite, least favorite F word is right now in the spring. Not going to say it. And then in the fall, it's a hot F word. And I don't like that one either. And, and so we just don't say those words. <laughs> Everyone's going, a cold hmm, one and the a F word. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that there are any signs or predictors that will help you uh, sense what kind of vintage is ahead of you? Oh, yes. Every every day, we're always thinking about next harvest. So we're already okay. It's bit we had rain in, in early rain, a lot, but really quick. No rain after that. So we're already, we're already okay thinking about yields, thinking about how much water are we gonna have? Every every day, 
you're basically thinking, okay, how is this affecting my grapes? Every single day. That's where uh, <laughs> winemakers are thinking every day about, okay, have we pruned? Okay, is it bud break? Okay, what's going on? I mean, every, are the fans on? We're always thinking every day of how it's gonna be in, impacting because we need to alter anything that we need to do. We would need to alter it ahead of time. If we're gonna have low, lower yields and not enough water, we need to make sure that we do have enough water to su support the heat spikes that we get sometimes. But when you have a lot of rain and you're looking at something, are you necessarily saying this is what that means for later or we deal with it now and see what comes next? And and, I mean, how much do you look ahead saying that's going to affect us in this way or that way? Well, we can only look so far ahead because it's Mother Nature again. <laughs> Here she is. She's in control. So, yeah, we, I mean, yes, we were excited. We're like, oh, my goodness. Come on, bring on this rain. It's going to be great. And then kind of stopped. And so that, okay, we're putting on a different head. We're gonna make sure that, okay, we've got our, our kind of drought head. We know what to do when we're going in that corner and we're still gonna be doing our rain dance every day in our office. <laughs> <laughs> so mother nature, you cannot control and she will do whatever she wants. But one thing you can control is sort of, um, uh, you know, good luck rituals. As a winery or as a winemaker, have you established any good luck rituals for yourself or for your team at the start of harvest? good luck ritual. Well, I don't have a harvest beard, so <laughs> no harvest beard for me. I have, my dad used to do, he used to do a harvest beard, and then uh, at, when, when we finished harvest, they call it, you shot the, the, shot the rabbit, and that's some kind of sneaky term, and then he would have a bubble bath in the house <laughs> with a cigar. <laughs> no, we had to go way somewhere else. And, and with like ZZ Top, bum, 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 and he'd shave his, his beard, so like, I remember those traditions. <laughs> And they were great. I was like, he's smoking a cigar in the house. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's <is> over. <laughs> so, so we, a little less dramatic. And, you know, be, be, still being relatively a young winemaker, I'm always making new traditions. For me, we're always going to do, uh, you know, do some kind of toast on the first day or blessing of the grapes, whether it's usually a not really religious, more just signifying like, hey, everybody, take notice because we're about to do something very special. And usually I bake cookies and, and, and try to you know, get, get people excited. And everyone likes sweets. And so we usually have like some sparkling and some sweets. There could be some savoring involved. I, I, I definitely like that. And you know, I like to know when other, my, our other sister winery is like, hey, are, are you doing your blessing of the grapes? Let me come over and, and, sh and have a glass of wine with you guys and, and cheers your harvest. So it's really, that's, that's fun. I mean, it's, it's the first grapes. <laughs> so once you have your grapes in and you've blessed them in your non-religious way, <laughs> I'm curious, um, you know, I'm sure you visit the vineyards throughout the season and walk the vines. Um, do you at any point talk to the grapes? Do you talk to them when they're on the vines? Do you speak to your wine what's in barrel? Do you cox it along? Do you encourage it or do you just ignore it? Well, I was going to say, how did you know? <laughs> I'm always, I, uh, so my, I mean, my boyfriend says it's like living with a cartoon character. <laughs> I've lived alone a lot, so sometimes I just talk to myself. I don't have a lot of pets, so I just do talk to myself. Um, <laughs> no, I've talked to the grapes for sure. I'm always talking. And then I like, sometimes I slap the tank a little bit. Cabs, they like it a little rougher. So I'm like, hey, baby, <laughs> how you doing? They like a little, little spicy love, so I definitely am always, yes, I'm always talking to the wine. Sometimes they'll be like, you are being, a, like, I get a little upset, and I'm like, okay, tone it back, Alicia. This, you're, you're going to be a shining star. <laughs> so I'm always giving it pep talks. I'm, yeah, I'm totally talking to the wine, slapping barrels. I'm like, how you doing? You seem like a natural at this, but I'm curious. When you were a little girl, what did you want to be when you grew up? Leanne Rhymes. <laughs> Our school teacher. <laughs> and yet here you are, <laughs> teaching those grapes. <laughs> so when you're not working, how do you like to spend your free time? I uh, I'm very I try to stay really active. We're constantly hiking. As I said, we just got back from Costa Rica, and I spent two nights hiking in in the jungle there. Mm. We did so. I'm we're hiking all around Sonoma County. This is kind of a definite perk of why I left the Central Valley. Is like I like these hills 
right around me. And I like to be able to hike a lot. I do a lot of crafting, uh, like handmade cards for my friends. Aww. I just had two friends who are having babies, so they get a baby card. And if it's your birthday and I make sure that I, it's, it's all my friends' birthdays are during fall. So it's really <laughs> a, a kind of drifted away from the birthday cards because it's always during harvest. But yeah, hand making cards. I love I that. I like that. I like that. And um, so you're into hiking and um, you mentioned your boyfriend. So I'm curious for a romantic evening with your boyfriend, what sort of wines would you open to set the mood? Well, we're working on his palate. So um, for me, and it's a rule for me, is I'm never, I'm not opening really nice wine. I'm not, or like, I'm not going to bring it to you. You have to have it with me. Uh So usually I have to kind of tell him, hey, you have to use a regular glass, (laughs) not a little, like the little, he likes a little tumbler kind of thing. I'm like, no, we're not in Italy and this is not the house wine. This is some wine I want you to taste. And, and then you can you can drink it after that. <laughs> <laughs> but usually we'll start maybe a variation. So I like, you know, we'll start with something fruity or I'll be like, hey, I just made this. Can you taste it? And he'll be like, yeah, it's okay. And I'm like, okay. but well, So we're working on, on his wine connoisseuring, but usually it'll be my, my mother and I. She'll be like, okay, Alicia's here. We got to open up something nice. Romantic evenings with your mom. Uh, well, heck <laughs> yes. Heck yes. Yes, yeah, so we'll we'll open some of the old Hewitts uh, or provenances that that we got oh, when nice. when we first harvest. So uh, that's always always super fun. Uh, so um, when you look back at your career or your life, is there a piece of advice that someone gave you that you try to live by or work by? And what was it? I uh, there was I have a winemaker a colleague who kind of told me of like make your wines. They like, don't. We'll get influenced by other people of like, make it this like this, make it like this, or do and you know, trust your palate and make your wines. You know what you're doing. And being, you know, it was an accomplishment to become a winemaker at 30, and I was like, hell yeah, I'm rocking this. This is what I do. And continue to just have that confidence in yourself because really our job is everyday changing and we're really just problem solvers so how well can we problem solve and do that in a team and really make the wine shine Hmm. and if you could give our listeners a piece of advice what would what kind of advice would you want to give a bunch of wine enthusiasts do a harvest i would say do work a harvest if you want and if you're young or old work a harvest um it's very labor intensive and not just a uh, oh, I want to do two weeks. No, I'm talking about doing, doing, doing the whole harvest. The best experience that I have was being able to, I saved all my money and I did those harvests back to back. Most people are able to do one harvest and, and, and then they just don't, you don't have enough money. I made money through 4-H. I was catered. And so I was really able to just kind of, in some areas at South Africa, break even. Maybe mm. not even. I, I was getting paid $200 a month. Mm. Uh, but the experience is exactly. valuable. Exactly. So <laughs> travel. Save your money so that you can go and work and travel. Work and travel. I, I really have a strong work ethic. And so that allowed, you know, me being able to work and travel allowed me to travel. Uh, <laughs> And make it be okay in my like parents' mind. Well, speaking of work ethic, when you look back at your career, and you have a long career ahead of you, you're still very young, um, but I'm curious, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date? I think my proudest achievement to date is that I became a winemaker, a head winemaker at 30, and that I've done this pulling my bootstraps straight up. I've networked, I've got great mentors that I've surrounded myself with, I've expanded my community through joining Women through women for Wine Sense. I think that my biz- biggest success is myself. You know, I, I my family has almonds. And I'm like, <laughs> rip, out, rip out those grapes because you're going to make more money. And I moved away from them. So me, just my independence, what I've really done with my career and how I've, I've excelled, it's something that is a huge achievement, and I I have to just kudos myself a little bit. Cheers to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that. So, complete this sentence for me. A table without wine is like... Well, I hope it has other alcoholic beverages, <laughs> at least. It sounds a little boring. <laughs> Um, and now another imaginary question for you. We're, we're just going to get your, well, you're very creative. I think you can do this. But if you can imagine a scenario, we're sitting at a dinner table and um, you're sharing your wines as you like to do with people. 
who from any walk of life would you want to share a bottle of Banshee wines with? Okay, so I, I've thought about this question because I, I uh, and it made me cry. Um, <laughs> it would be both my grand, my both sets of grandparents. Um, my old, like my mother's set were very old, and so I think it would be so interesting to, like, I don't think they would know what was going on. Um, <laughs> I never had met them, and I thought that would be really cool. And my my paternal my father said you know they passed away when I was just 17 and just a punk really so it would be I think they would be so proud uh, of this wonderful sassy lady that I've become <laughs> <laughs> and uh, making some really kick-ass wines I love it I love it so if you had to go to a deserted island what three wines would you want to take with you any three wines deserted island well okay well I, I wouldn't bring my my favorites because it would be way too hot no no it's your island it can be any weather condition oh. you want <laughs> <laughs> okay it's then, imaginary oh, okay imaginary <laughs> island well then we're gonna do some large formats because of we're course. gonna capitalize on this um let's see some of my favorite wines probably something that that we so will probably throw lancaster in there Something from Hewitt, and then probably an old duck horn. Uh, from all Tom Cabernets. Reynolds. Well, that's my heart and soul, baby. Ah, <laughs> all Cabernets. Okay. Well, and it's, it will do the job if I'm in it. <laughs> if I'm on an island, any temperature, large format, a little higher alcohol. I think that does. A gr I'm not happy. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Just going to an island with Cabernet, Cabernet, Cabernet. Yeah. <laughs> so. We always play a little game because we're almost at the end here. We always little, play a little game where we like to pair wine and music. It is called Wine Soundtrack After All. Based on some of the wines we talked about, some of the wines that we have in front of us, some of your wines, I want you to pair them with music. It can be a genre. It could just be a style of music. It could be a specific artist or a specific song. It's really up to you wherever. Don't stress out about it. But uh, we've been sipping on your 2021 uh, Banshee Rosé of Pinot Noir, and I'm wondering... What does that make you think of? So um, I have I listen to a lot of a lot of crazy music, what all over the place. It really just sometimes it's nice just background. But um, I think for the road, and I'm, I'm definitely younger. I'm a millennial, so <laughs> I think we're gonna do some like tropical house music with this this rosé, okay. and um, and then I was thinking like with the, the well yeah let's let's go to next well, like the Pinot Noir. your Pinot Noir this is the Banshee Sonoma County 2019 Pinot Noir I I explain this Pinot too is that you're driving from Carneros through Sonoma County through the Redwoods up and then out to the coast and like Bodega or Jenner and so really some good driving music so that you have like. Maybe it could be some fun psychedelic music. Maybe it could be some like really relaxed, like focus flow kind of playlist music. Um, but really, like dri driving, I think it just like takes you taking the time with the music, yeah. not just a one song kind of thing. Got it. And then uh, your Banshee Durrell Vineyard, so a vineyard specific Pinot Noir. Okay, so our marketing did a great job with the notes. They kind of, they did some kind of geeky, uh, some Star Wars. So oh. that's great uh, because also, I mean, I'm come from the Central Valley. Hello, that is where George Lucas is from. <laughs> My uncle went to high school with him, so I've got a, a half a tiny carrot of claim to fame. So we had to do like the like the Star Wars thing. <laughs> Plus, I mean, who doesn't like Star Wars? <laughs> And then your uh, beloved Cabernet. Let's go with uh, Hewitt Cabernet. Oh, whoa. Okay, so the, some of the, the big Hewitts. We're going to do like a big sexy something, like maybe some jazzy, but like attitude. Not too smooth, but just smooth enough. Oh. So now I need to start playing music and drinking your wine because I'm <laughs> getting thirsty. But as we finish here, I'm wondering, I have one last question for you. Um... What wine region in the world is at the top of your list that you want to explore next? So I've been to quite a few, and I was th I've, I've, I've kind of was thinking about this question, and I think so. I when I worked in Italy, I did mostly central and and southern, and so I'd like to hit. I've got a a, a friend who works in Austria, and they own a winery, and we were interns together. I, I want to go to his winery. They make great wines. 
So Austria, Northern Italy, Europe, maybe maybe some Ger. I mean, yeah, I had a lot of German wines living in Denmark because that's just right there. So when you're not um, doing cherry wine. Yeah, <laughs> no, which was great. It was so so fun. Um, yeah, I'd like to do some of the, some of those cooler cooler climates because I've been. I mean, I've been in a lot of places. So it'll be interesting too to. Like we gotta go back and take, see how the wines have evolved and That's like right. how, what are what's changed. So I'll have to do like another a, a loop. I need to go <laughs> back to Italy. I need to say hello to everybody and that you know treated me so well and helped me with my career. Well, and for people who uh, might want to come to Sonoma as their next destination, um, how can they visit Banshee? Where can they find you guys? Um, are you you're distributed in some markets with some wines? What markets are you in? And then how do they visit you and taste? in person so you can find our wines in some grocery stores and outlets you'll find the sonoma county pinot the shard the cabernet our mordecai and some of our rosé really the pinot the more the reds are the drivers there and so and these are in all markets not all markets you know, I'm, I a am lot. only the winemaker, so I'm like, uh, <laughs> we're, we're expanding, and we've got some in Florida, we're, uh, we're, we're all over. Uh, my, my mom keeps trying to find them in Modesto and, and, like, looking for the display. Not at her local Safeway, okay. but at many, and Vaughn's, <laughs> Albertson's Pavilions. We've got some really fun stuff on the other, on on the East Coast and in, in the Midwest, and I just haven't been out there yet because of, of uh, you know, COVID and all this, so I haven't really reached into the markets, but, with, but we're there, and we are excited to be, but also where I live in Healdsburg and where our tasting room is just right around the, the corner from the downtown square, the plaza, um, which is just lovely in Healdsburg. You can taste during the our winter hours. I, we're closed on Tuesdays and, and Wednesdays, but during the summer we're open, I think, every day. Mm -hmm. And you can make an appointment online at BansheeWines.com. You can buy our wines online and become part of the Foley Food and Wine Society, which has a tons of perks and it's also a tongue twister for me. And um, yeah, come to the tasting room and come have a glass of wine with me. <laughs> uh, Alicia, thank you so much for joining us today on Wine Soundtrack. I hope you had a good time. It's been wonderful, wonderful to hear your story. And uh, I think next time I'm up in Sonoma, I'll be on the Healdsburg Square. So I'll come step over and say hello. Yeah, I really hope you do. If I'm available, I'll ride my bike right on down and uh, we'll enjoy a glass of wine together. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.